Introduction to Sociology, 3rd Edition, an OpenStax textbook. This free audiobook is a public service of Los Angeles Harbor College. Register for in-person and online courses today by visiting www.lahc.edu. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 16. Education. Introduction. What the educator does in teaching is to make it possible for the students to become themselves. Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. David Simon, in his 1995 book, Social Problems and the Sociological Imagination, a paradigm for analysis, points to the notion that social problems are, in essence, contradictions. That is, statements, ideas, or features of a situation that are opposed to one another. Consider then that one of the greatest expectations in U.S. society is that to attain any form of success in life, a person needs an education. In fact, a college degree is rapidly becoming an expectation at many levels of success, not merely an enhancement to our occupational choices. And as you might expect, the number of people graduating from college in the United States continues to rise dramatically. The contradiction, however, lies in the fact that the more impactful a college degree has become, the harder it has become to achieve it. The cost of getting a college degree has risen sharply since the mid-1980s, while many important forms of government support have barely increased. The net result is that those who do graduate from college are likely to begin a career in debt. As of 2009, a typical student's loans amounted to around $23,000. Ten years later, the average amount of debt for students who took loans grew to over $30,000. The overall national student loan debt topped $1.6 trillion in 2020, according to the Federal Reserve. These rising costs and risky debt burdens have led to a number of diverse proposals for solutions. Some call for canceling current college debt and making more colleges free to qualifying students. Others advocate for more focused and efficient education in order to achieve needed career requirements more quickly. Employers, seeking both to widen their applicant pool and increase equity among their workforce, have increasingly sought ways to eliminate unnecessary degree requirements. If a person has the skills and knowledge to do the job, they have more access to it. Is a college degree still worth it? Lifetime earnings among those with a college degree are, on average, still much higher than for those without. A 2019 Federal Reserve report indicated that, on average, college graduates earn $30,000 per year, more than non-college graduates. Also, that wage gap has nearly doubled in the past 40 years. Is the wage advantage enough to overcome the potential debt? And what's behind those averages? Remember, since the $30,000 is an average, it also confirms what we see from other data. That certain people and certain college majors earn far more than others. As a result, earning a college degree in a field that has a smaller wage advantage over non-college graduates might not seem worth it. But is college worth more than money? A student earning associate's and bachelor's degrees generally will often take a wide array of courses, including many outside of their major. The student is exposed to a fairly broad range of topics, from mathematics and the physical sciences to history and literature, the social sciences, and music and art through introductory and survey-styled courses. It is in this period that the student's worldview is, it is hoped, expanded. Then, when they begin the process of specialization, it is with a much broader perspective than might be otherwise. This additional cultural capital can further enrich the life of the student.
enhance their ability to work with experienced professionals, and build wisdom upon knowledge. Over 2,000 years ago, Socrates said, The unexamined life is not worth living. The real value of an education, then, is to enhance our skill at self-examination. Education, its impact, and its costs are important not just to sociologists, but to policymakers, employers, and, of course, to parents. Sixteen point one education around the world learning objectives by the end of this section you should be able to identify differences in educational resources around the world describe the concept of universal access to education education is a social institution through which members of a society are taught basic academic knowledge learning skills and cultural norms Every nation in the world is equipped with some form of education system, though those systems vary greatly. The major factors that affect education systems are the resources and money that are utilized to support those systems in different nations. As you might expect, a country's wealth has much to do with the amount of money spent on education. Countries that do not have such basic amenities as running water are unable to support robust education systems or, in many cases, any formal schooling at all. The result of this worldwide educational inequality is a social concern for many countries, including the United States. International differences in education systems are not solely a financial issue. The value placed on education, the amount of time devoted to it, and the distribution of education within a country also play a role in those differences. For example, students in South Korea spend 220 days a year in school compared to the 180 days a year of their United States counterparts. Then there is the issue of educational distribution and changes within a nation. The Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, is administered to samples of 15-year-old students worldwide. In 2010, the results showed that students in the United States had fallen from 15th to 25th in the rankings for science and math. The same program showed that by 2018, U.S. student achievement had remained on the same level for mathematics and science, but had shown improvements in reading. In 2018, about 4,000 students from about 200 high schools in the United States took the PIESA test. Analysts determined that the nations and city-states at the top of the rankings had several things in common. For one, they had well-established standards for education with clear goals for all students. They also recruited teachers from the top 5 to 10 percent of university graduates each year, which is not the case for most countries. Finally, there is the issue of social factors. One analyst from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the organization that created the PIESA test, attributed 20% of performance differences and the United States' low rankings to differences in social background. Researchers noted that educational resources, including money and quality teachers, are not distributed equitably in the United States. In the top-ranking countries, Limited access to resources did not necessarily predict low performance. Analysts also noted what they described as resilient students, or those students who achieve at a higher level than one might expect given their social background. In Shanghai and Singapore, the proportion of resilient students is about 70%. In the United States, it is below 30%. These insights suggest that the United States educational system may be on a descending path that could detrimentally affect the country's economy and its social landscape. Big Picture Education in Finland With public education in the United States under such intense criticism, why is it that Singapore, South Korea, and especially Finland, which is culturally most similar to us, have such excellent public education? Over the course of 30 years, the country has pulled itself from among the lowest rankings by the Organization of Economic Cooperation, OEDC.
two first in 2012, and remains, as of 2014, in the top five. Contrary to the rigid curriculum and long hours demanded of students in South Korea and Singapore, Finnish education often seems paradoxical to outside observers, because it appears to break a lot of the rules we take for granted. It is common for children to enter school at seven years old, and children will have more recess and less hours in school than U.S. children, approximately 300 less hours. Their homework load is light when compared to all other industrialized nations, nearly 300 fewer hours per year in elementary school. There are no gifted programs, almost no private schools, and no high-stakes national standardized tests. Prioritization is different than in the United States. There is an emphasis on allocating resources for those who need them most. High standards, support for special needs students, qualified teachers taken from the top 10% of the nation's graduates, and who must earn a master's degree, evaluation of education, balancing decentralization and centralization. We used to have a system which was really unequal, stated the Finnish education chief in an interview. My parents never had a real possibility to study and have a higher education. We decided in the 1960s that we would provide a free quality education to all. Even universities are free of charge. Equal means that we support everyone and we're not going to waste anyone's skills. As for teachers, we don't test our teachers or ask them to prove their knowledge. But it's true that we do invest in a lot of additional teacher training even after they become teachers. Yet over the past decade, Finland has consistently performed among the top nations on the PISA. Finland's school children didn't always excel. Finland built its excellent, efficient, and equitable educational system in a few decades from scratch, and the concept guiding almost every educational reform has been equity. The Finnish paradox is that by focusing on the bigger picture for all, Finland has succeeded at fostering the individual potential of most every child. We created a school system based on equality to make sure we can develop everyone's potential. Now we can see how well it's been working. Last year, the OECD tested adults from 24 countries measuring the skill levels of adults age 16 to 65 on a survey called the PIAAC, Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies, which tests skills in literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving in technology-rich environments. Finland scored at or near the top on all measures. Formal and Informal Education As already mentioned, education is not solely concerned with the basic academic concepts that a student learns in the classroom. Societies also educate their children, outside of the school system, in matters of everyday practical living. These two types of learning are referred to as formal education and informal education. Formal education describes the learning of academic facts and concepts through a formal curriculum. Arising from the tutelage of ancient Greek thinkers, centuries of scholars have examined topics through formalized methods of learning. Education in earlier times was only available to the higher classes. They had the means for access to scholarly materials, plus the luxury of leisure time that could be used for learning. The Industrial Revolution and its accompanying social changes made education more accessible to the general population. Many families in the emerging middle class found new opportunities for schooling. The modern U.S. educational system is the result of this progression. Today, basic education is considered a right and responsibility for all citizens. Expectations of this system focus on formal education, with curricula and testing designed to ensure that students learn the facts and concepts that society believes are basic knowledge. In contrast, informal education describes learning about cultural values, norms, and expected behaviors by participating in a society. This type of learning occurs both through the formal education system and at home. Our earliest learning experiences generally happen via parents, relatives, and others in our community. Through informal education, we learn important life skills that help us get through the day and interact with each other, including how to dress for different occasions, 
how to perform regular tasks such as shopping for and preparing food, and how to keep our bodies clean. Many professional tasks and local customs are learned informally, as well. Cultural transmission refers to the way people come to learn the values, beliefs, and social norms of their culture. Both informal and formal education include cultural transmission. For example, a student will learn about cultural aspects of modern history in a U.S. history classroom. In that same classroom, the student might learn the cultural norm for asking a classmate out on a date through passing notes and whispered conversations. Access to Education Another global concern in education is universal access. This term refers to people's equal ability to participate in an education system. On a world level, Access might be more difficult for certain groups based on class or gender, as was the case in the United States earlier in the nation's history, a dynamic we still struggle to overcome. The modern idea of universal access arose in the United States as a concern for people with disabilities. In the United States, one way in which universal education is supported is through federal and state governments covering the cost of free public education. Of course, the way this plays out in terms of school budgets and taxes makes this an often contested topic on the national, state, and community levels. Table 16.1 displays the differences in the per-student education spending in each of the 50 states and Washington, D.C. While the table is too long to include in this audio-only version of the textbook, it clearly demonstrates variation between the states. For instance, the state of New York spends the most per student at $24,040. In last place is the state of Utah at $7,628 per student. A precedent for universal access to education in the United States was set with the 1972 U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia's decision in Mills v. Board of Education of the District of Columbia. This case was brought on the behalf of seven school-age children with special needs who argued that the school board was denying their access to free public education. The school board maintained that the children's exceptional needs, which included intellectual disabilities, precluded their right to be educated for free in a public school setting. The board argued that the cost of educating these children would be too expensive and that the children would therefore have to remain at home without access to education. This case was resolved in a hearing without any trial. The judge, Joseph Cornelius Waddy, upheld the students' right to education, finding that they were to be given either public education services or private education paid for by the Washington, D.C. Board of Education. He noted that, Constitutional rights must be afforded citizens despite the greater expense involved. The District of Columbia's interest in educating the excluded children clearly must outweigh its interest in preserving its financial resources. The inadequacies of the District of Columbia public school system, whether occasioned by insufficient funding or administrative inefficiency, certainly cannot be permitted to bear more heavily on the exceptional or handicapped child than on the normal child. Mills v. Board of Education, 1972. Today, the optimal way to include people with disabilities students in standard classrooms is still being researched and debated. Inclusion is a method that involves complete immersion in a standard classroom, whereas mainstreaming balances time in a special needs classroom with standard classroom participation. There continues to be social debate surrounding how to implement the ideal of universal access to education. Sixteen point two theoretical perspectives on education. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you should be able to define manifest and latent functions of education. Explain and discuss how functionalism, conflict theory, feminism, and interactionism view issues of education. While it is clear that education plays an integral role in individuals' lives as well as society as a whole, sociologists view that role from many diverse points of view. 
functionalists believe that education equips people to perform different functional roles in society. Conflict theorists view education as a means of widening the gap in social inequality. Feminist theorists point to evidence that sexism in education continues to prevent women from achieving a full measure of social equality. Symbolic interactionists study the dynamics of the classroom, the interactions between students and teachers, and how those affect everyday life. In this section, you will learn about each of these perspectives. Functionalism. Functionalists view education as one of the more important social institutions in a society. They contend that education contributes two kinds of functions, manifest or primary functions, which are the intended and visible functions of education, and latent or secondary functions, which are the hidden and unintended functions. Manifest functions. There are several major manifest functions associated with education. The first is socialization. Beginning in preschool and kindergarten, students are taught to practice various societal roles. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim, 1858-1917, who established the academic discipline of sociology, characterized schools as socialization agencies that teach children how to get along with others and prepare them for adult economic roles. Indeed, it seems that schools have taken on this responsibility in full. This socialization also involves learning the rules and norms of the society as a whole. In the early days of compulsory education, students learned the dominant culture. Today, since the culture of the United States is increasingly diverse, students may learn a variety of cultural norms, not only that of the dominant culture. School systems in the United States also transmit the core values of the nation through manifest functions like social control. One of the roles of schools is to teach students conformity to law and respect for authority. Obviously, such respect, given to teachers and administrators, will help a student navigate the school environment. This function also prepares students to enter the workplace and the world at large, where they will continue to be subject to people who have authority over them. Fulfillment of this function rests primarily with classroom teachers and instructors who are with students all day. Education also provides one of the major methods used by people for upward social mobility. This function is referred to as social placement. College and graduate schools are viewed as vehicles for moving students closer to the careers that will give them the financial freedom and security they seek. As a result, College students are often more motivated to study areas that they believe will be advantageous on the social ladder. A student might value business courses over a class in Victorian poetry because she sees business class as a stronger vehicle for financial success. Latent Functions Education also fulfills latent functions. As you well know, much goes on in a school that has little to do with formal education. For example, you might notice an attractive fellow student when he gives a particularly interesting answer in class. Catching up with him and making a date speaks to the latent function of courtship fulfilled by exposure to a peer group in the educational setting. The educational setting introduces students to social networks that might last for years and can help people find jobs after their schooling is complete. Of course, with social media such as Facebook and LinkedIn, these networks are easier than ever to maintain. Another latent function is the ability to work with others in small groups, a skill that is transferable to a workplace and that might not be learned in a homeschool setting. The educational system, especially as experienced on university campuses, has traditionally provided a place for students to learn about various social issues. There is ample opportunity for social and political advocacy as well as the ability to develop tolerance to the many views represented on campus. In 2011, the Occupy Wall Street movement swept across college campuses all over the United States, leading to demonstrations in which diverse groups of students were unified with the purpose 
of changing the political climate of the country. Table 16.2 Manifest and Latent Functions of Education According to functionalist theory, education contributes both manifest and latent functions. The manifest functions of education are the openly stated functions and intended goals of education. They include socialization, transmission of culture, social control, social placement, and cultural innovation. The latent functions of education are the hidden, unstated functions with sometimes unintended consequences. They include courtship, social networks, group work, creation of generation gaps, and political and social integration. Functionalists recognize other ways that schools educate and enculturate students. One of the most important U.S. values students in the United States learn is that of individualism, the valuing of the individual over the value of groups or society as a whole. In countries such as Japan and China, where the good of the group is valued over the rights of the individual, students do not learn as they do in the United States that the highest rewards go to the best individual in academics as well as athletics. One of the roles of schools in the United States is fostering self-esteem. Conversely, schools in Japan focus on fostering social esteem, the honoring of the group over the individual. In the United States, schools also fill the role of preparing students for competition in life. Obviously, athletics foster a competitive nature, but even in the classroom students compete against one another academically. Schools also fill the role of teaching patriotism. Students recite the Pledge of Allegiance each morning and take history classes where they learn about national heroes and the nation's past. Another role of schools, according to functionalist theory, is that of sorting or classifying students based on academic merit or potential. The most capable students are identified early in schools through testing and classroom achievements. Such students are placed in accelerated programs in anticipation of successful college attendance. Functionalists also contend that school, particularly in recent years, is taking over some of the functions that were traditionally undertaken by family. Society relies on schools to teach about human sexuality as well as basic skills such as budgeting and job applications, topics that at one time were addressed by the family. Conflict theory. Conflict theorists do not believe that public schools reduce social inequality. Rather, they believe that the educational system reinforces and perpetuates social inequalities that arise from differences in class, gender, race, and ethnicity. Where functionalists see education as serving a beneficial role, conflict theorists view it more negatively. To them, educational systems preserve the status quo and push people of lower status into obedience. The fulfillment of one's education is closely linked to social class. Students of low socioeconomic status are generally not afforded the same opportunities as students of higher status, no matter how great their academic ability or desire to learn. Picture a student from a working-class home who wants to do well in school. On a Monday, he's assigned a paper that's due Friday. Monday evening, he has to babysit his younger sister while his divorced mother works. Tuesday and Wednesday, he works stocking shelves after school until 10 p.m. by Thursday, the only day he might have available to work on that assignment. He's so exhausted, he can't bring himself to start the paper. His mother, though she'd like to help him, is so tired herself that she isn't able to give him the encouragement or support he needs. And since English is her second language, she has difficulty with some of his educational materials. They also lack a computer and printer at home, which most of his classmates have. So they have to rely on the public library or school system for access to technology. As this story shows, many students from working class families have to contend with helping out at home, contributing financially to the family, poor study environments, and a lack of support from their families. This is a difficult match with education systems that adhere to a traditional curriculum 
that is more easily understood and completed by students of higher social classes. Such a situation leads to social class reproduction, extensively studied by French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. He researched how cultural capital or cultural knowledge that serves, metaphorically, as currency that helps us navigate a culture, alters the experiences and opportunities available to French students from different social classes. Members of the upper and middle classes have more cultural capital than do families of lower class status. As a result, the educational system maintains a cycle in which the dominant culture's values are rewarded. Instruction and tests cater to the dominant culture and leave others struggling to identify with values and competencies outside their social class. For example, there has been a great deal of discussion over what standardized tests, such as the SAT, truly measure. Many argue that the tests group students by cultural ability rather than by natural intelligence. The cycle of rewarding those who possess cultural capital is found in formal educational curricula as well as in the hidden curriculum, which refers to the type of non-academic knowledge that students learn through informal learning and cultural transmission. This hidden curriculum reinforces the positions of those with higher cultural capital and serves to bestow status unequally. Conflict theorists point to tracking, a formalized sorting system that places students on tracks, advanced versus low achievers, that perpetuate inequalities. While educators may believe that students do better in tracked classes because they are with students of similar ability and may have access to more individual attention from teachers, conflict theorists feel that tracking leads to self-fulfilling prophecies in which students live up or down to teacher and societal expectations. To conflict theorists, schools play the role of training working-class students to accept and retain their position as lower members of society. They argue that this role is fulfilled through the disparity of resources available to students in richer and poorer neighborhoods, as well as through testing. IQ tests have been attacked for being biased, for testing cultural knowledge rather than actual intelligence. For example, a test item may ask students what instruments belong in an orchestra. To correctly answer this question, requires certain cultural knowledge, knowledge most often held by more affluent people who typically have more exposure to orchestral music. Though experts in testing claim that bias has been eliminated from tests, conflict theorists maintain that this is impossible. These tests to conflict theorists are another way in which education does not provide opportunities, but instead maintains an established configuration of power. Feminist theory. Feminist theory aims to understand the mechanisms and roots of gender inequality in education, as well as their societal repercussions. Like many other institutions of society, educational systems are characterized by unequal treatment and opportunity for women. Almost two-thirds of the world's 862 million illiterate people are women. And the illiteracy rate among women is expected to increase in many regions especially in several African and Asian countries. Women in the United States have been relatively late, historically speaking, to be granted entry to the public university system. In fact, it wasn't until the establishment of Title IX of the Education Amendments in 1972 that discriminating on the basis of sex in U.S. education programs became illegal. In the United States, there is also a post-education gender disparity between what male and female college graduates earn. A study released in May 2011 showed that, among men and women who graduated from college between 2006 and 2010, men out-earned women by an average of more than $5,000 each year. First-year job earnings for men averaged $33,150. For women, the average was $28,000. Similar trends are seen among salaries of professionals in virtually all industries. When women face limited opportunities for education, their capacity to achieve equal rights, including financial independence, are limited. Feminist theory 
seeks to promote women's rights to equal education and its resultant benefits across the world. Sociology in the real world. Grade inflation. When is an A? Really a C? In 2019, news emerged of a criminal conspiracy regarding wealthy and, in some cases, celebrity parents who illegally secured college admission for their children. Over 50 people were implicated in the scandal, including employees from prestigious universities. Several people were sentenced to prison. Their activity included manipulating test scores, falsifying students' academic or athletic credentials, and acquiring testing accommodations through dishonest claims of having a disability. One of the questions that emerged at the time was how the students at the subject of these efforts could succeed at these challenging and elite colleges. Meaning if they couldn't get in without cheating, they probably wouldn't do well. Wouldn't their lack of preparation quickly become clear? Many people would say no. First, many of the students involved, the children of the conspirators, had no knowledge or no involvement of the fraud. Those students may have been admitted anyway. But there may be another safeguard for underprepared students at certain universities, grade inflation. Grade inflation generally refers to a practice of awarding students higher grades than they have earned. It reflects the observation that the relationship between letter grades and the achievements they reflect has been changing over time. Put simply, what used to be considered C-level, or average, now often earns a student a B, or even an A. Some, including administrators at elite universities, argue that grade inflation does not exist, or that there are other factors at play, or even that it has benefits such as increased funding and elimination of inequality. But the evidence reveals a stark change, based on data compiled from a wide array of four-year colleges and universities a widely cited study revealed that the number of A grades has been increasing by several percentage points per decade, and that A's were the most common grade awarded. In an anecdotal case, a Harvard dean acknowledged that the median grade there was an A, and the most common was also an A. Williams College found that the number of A-plus grades had grown from 212 instances in 2009-10 to 426 instances in 2017-18. Princeton University took steps to reduce inflation by limiting the number of A's that could be issued, though it then reversed course. Why is this happening? Some cite the alleged shift toward a culture that rewards effort instead of product, i.e., the amount of work a student puts in raises the grade, even if the resulting product is poor quality. Another off-cited contributor is the pressure for instructors to earn positive course evaluations from their students. Finally, many colleges may accept a level of grade inflation because it works. Analysis and formal experiments involving graduate school admissions and hiring practices show that students with higher grades are more likely to be selected for a job or a grad school. And those higher grade applicants are still preferred, even if decision maker knows that the applicant's college may be inflating grades. In other words, people with high GPA at a school with a higher average GPA are preferred over people who have a high GPA at a school with a lower average GPA. Ironically, grade inflation is not simply a college issue. Many of the same college faculty and administrators who encounter or engage in some level of grade inflation may lament that it is also occurring at high schools. Symbolic Interactionism Symbolic interactionism sees education as one way that labeling theory is seen in action. A symbolic interactionist might say that this labeling has a direct correlation to those who are in power and those who are labeled. For example, low standardized test scores or poor performance in a particular class often lead to a student who is labeled as a low achiever. Such labels are difficult to shake off which can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. In his book, High School Confidential, Jeremy Iverson details his experience as a Stanford graduate posing as a student at a California high school. One of the problems he identifies in his research is that of teachers applying labels that students are never able to lose. One teacher told him, without knowing he was a bright graduate of a top university, that he would never amount to anything Iverson obviously didn't take this teacher's false assessment to heart. 
But when an actual 17-year-old student hears this from a person with authority over her, it's no wonder that the student might begin to live down to that label. The labeling with which symbolic interactionists concern themselves extends to the very degrees that symbolize completion of education. Credentialism embodies the emphasis on certificates or degrees to show that a person has a certain skill, has attained a certain level of education, or has met certain job qualifications. These certificates or degrees serve as a symbol of what a person has achieved and allows the labeling of that individual. Indeed, as these examples show, labeling theory can significantly impact a student's schooling. This is easily seen in the educational setting as teachers and more powerful social groups within the school dole out labels that are adopted by the entire school population. Sixteen point three issues in education. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you should be able to identify historical and contemporary issues in education, discuss the impacts of educational equality efforts, explain important United States government actions and programs in education. As schools strive to fill a variety of roles in their students' lives, many issues and challenges arise. Students walk a minefield of bullying, violence in schools, the results of declining funding, changes due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and other problems that affect their education. When Americans are asked about their opinion of public education on the Gallup poll each year, reviews are mixed at best. Schools are no longer merely a place for learning and socializing. With the landmark Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, ruling in 1954, schools became a repository of much political and legal action that is at the heart of several issues in education. Equal Education Until the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education ruling, schools had operated under the precedent set by Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896 which allowed racial segregation in schools and private businesses, the case dealt specifically with railroads and introduced the much maligned phrase, separate but equal, into the U.S. lexicon. The 1954 Brown v. Board decision overruled this, declaring that state laws that had established separate schools for black and white students were, in fact, unequal and unconstitutional. While the ruling paved the way toward civil rights, it was also met with contention in many communities. In Arkansas in 1957, the governor mobilized the state National Guard to prevent black students from entering Little Rock Central High School. President Eisenhower, in response, sent members of the 101st Airborne Division from Kentucky to uphold the students' right to enter the school. In 1963, Almost 10 years after the ruling, Governor George Wallace of Alabama used his own body to block two black students from entering the auditorium at the University of Alabama to enroll in the school. Wallace's desperate attempt to uphold his policy of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, stated during his 1963 inauguration, became known as the stand in the schoolhouse door. He refused to grant entry to the students until a general from the Alabama National Guard arrived on President Kennedy's order. Presently, students of all races and ethnicities are permitted into schools, but there remains a troubling gap in the equality of education they receive. The long-term socially embedded effects of racism and other discrimination and disadvantage have left a residual mark of inequality in the nation's education system. Students from wealthy families and those of lower socioeconomic status do not receive the same opportunities. Today's public schools, at least in theory, are positioned to help remedy those gaps. Predicated on the notion of universal access, this system is mandated to accept and retain all students regardless of race, religion, social class, and the like. Moreover, 
public schools are held accountable to equitable per-student spending. Private schools, usually only accessible to students from high-income families, and schools in more affluent areas generally enjoy access to greater resources and better opportunities. In fact, some of the key predictors for student performance include socioeconomic status and family background. Children from families of lower socioeconomic status often enter school with learning deficits they struggle to overcome throughout their educational tenure. These patterns, uncovered in the landmark Coleman Report of 1966, are still highly relevant today, as sociologists still generally agree that there is a great divide in the performance of white students from affluent backgrounds and their non-white, less affluent, counterparts. The findings in the Coleman Report were so powerful that they brought about two major changes to education in the United States. The Federal Head Start Program, which is still active and successful today, was developed to give low-income students an opportunity to make up the preschool deficit discussed in Coleman's findings. The program provides academic-centered preschool to students of low socioeconomic status. Transfers and Buzzing In the years following Brown v. Board of Education, the southern states were not alone in their resistance to change. In New York City, schools in lower-income neighborhoods had less experienced teachers, inadequate facilities, and lower spending per student than did schools in higher-income neighborhoods, even though all of the schools were in the same district. In 1958, activist May Mallory, with the support of grassroots advocate Ella Baker and the NACP, led a group of parents who kept their children out of school, essentially boycotting the district. She and the rest of the group, known as the Harlem Nine, were publicly chastised and pursued by the judicial system. After several decisions and appeals, the culminating legal decision found that the city was effectively segregating schools and that students in certain neighborhoods were still receiving a discriminatorily inferior education. New York City, the nation's largest school district, enacted an open transfer policy that laid the groundwork for further action. With the goal of further desegregating education, courts across the United States ordered some school districts to begin a program that became known as Buzzing. This program involved bringing students to schools outside their neighborhoods, and therefore schools they would not normally have the opportunity to attend, to bring racial diversity into balance. This practice was met with a great deal of public resistance from people on both sides dissatisfied with white students traveling to inner-city schools and minority students being transported to schools in the suburbs. No child left behind, and every student succeeds. In 2001, the Bush administration passed the No Child Left Behind Act, which requires states to test students in grades 3 through 8. The results of those tests determine eligibility to receive federal funding. Schools that do not meet the standards set by the act run the risk of having their funding cut. Sociologists and teachers alike have contended that the impact of the No Child Left Behind Act is far more negative than positive, arguing that a one-size-fits-all concept cannot apply to education. As a result of widespread criticism, many of the national aspects of the act were gradually altered, and in 2015, they were essentially eliminated. That year, Congress passed the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESA. The law decreases the federal role in education. Annual testing is still required, but the Achievement and Improvement Accountability is shifted to the states, which must submit plans and goals regarding their approaches to the U.S. Department of Education for approval. While this aspect of ESA was delayed for several years under the Trump administration, the Department of Education announced in April 2020 that Massachusetts had become the first to have its plans approved. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed many states' further action in terms of essay approval. New Views on Standardized Tests The funding tie-in of the No Child Left Behind Act has led to the social phenomenon commonly called teaching to the test, 
which describes when a curriculum focuses on equipping students to succeed on standardized tests to the detriment of broader educational goals and concepts of learning. At issue are two approaches to classroom education. The notion that teachers impart knowledge that students are obligated to absorb versus the concept of student-centered learning that seeks to teach children not facts, but problem-solving abilities and learning skills. Both types of learning have been valued in the U.S. school system. The former, to critics of teaching to the test, only equips students to regurgitate facts, while the latter, to proponents of the other camp, fosters lifelong learning and transferable work skills. The Scholastic Aptitude Test, SAT, and the American College Testing, ACT, have for decades served as rites of passage for millions of high school students. Colleges utilize the scores as benchmarks in the admissions process. Since the tests have been important in college admissions, many families place significant emphasis on preparing for them. However, the disparity in how much money families are able to spend on that preparation results in inequities. SAT and ACT prep courses and tutors are expensive, and not everyone can afford them. As a result, the inequity found in K-12 education may extend to college. For years, college admissions programs have been taking these disparities into account and have based admissions on factors beyond standardized test scores. However, issues with the tests remain. In 2020, a slate of highly selective colleges eliminated their standardized test requirement for admission, and in 2021, several colleges expanded and extended their test-optional approach. Students with Disabilities Since the 1978 implementation of what would become the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, states and local districts have continually increased their investment in the quality of education for students with disabilities. The Act's reauthorization coupled with no child left behind, added requirements and guidance for states and school districts. Until that point in time, students with intellectual or other disabilities had been steadily improving their achievement, graduation rates, and success in post-high school endeavors. However, significant disparities existed and persist today, based on race, ethnicity, and also on geography. Beyond the quality of education for students with disabilities, the disparity was often most noticeable in the classification of those students. States varied on which disabilities received services and how much support was provided. Many students with dyslexia, ADHD, and other disorders are either not diagnosed, not taken seriously, or not given as much support as they require in order to succeed. This can extend into adulthood. For example, ADHD was for years considered only a children's disease, something that people grew out of. But the disorder can impact people at any age, something that many educators and even some doctors are not aware of. No, child left behind's focus on standards and standardized testing extended to students with disabilities as well. A core goal was that students with disabilities would work toward the same standards and take the same tests, with accommodations, if needed, as did students without disabilities. The outcomes were mixed. Test performance for students with disabilities increased, but so did dropouts. There was also evidence that some schools were less welcoming to students with disabilities as a way to increase average scores. In general, Programs have improved to the point that students with disabilities are graduating from high school at a national average of about 73%. This is lower than the average graduation rate for students in all populations, which is 88%, but it is a vast improvement over previous decades. However, several issues remain. First, Students from lower income and areas and states with lower education budgets still are offered far fewer services. They graduate high school at a much lower rate than the average. Second, because identification remains a major gap, many students with disabilities may be in the mainstream population 
but are not supported as well as they should be. Even when this group gets to college, they may be starting with a lower level of preparation. School choice. As we have seen, education is not equal and people have varied needs. Parents, guardians, and child advocates work to obtain the best schooling for children, which may take them outside the traditional environment. Public school alternatives to traditional schools include vocational schools, special education schools, magnet schools, charter schools, alternative schools, early college schools, and virtual schools. Private school options may include religious and non-religious options, as well as boarding schools. In some locations, a large number of students engage in these options. For example, in North Carolina, one in five students does not attend a traditional public school. Homeschooling refers to children being educated in their own homes, typically by a parent, instead of in a traditional public or private school system. Proponents of this type of education argue that it provides an outstanding opportunity for student-centered learning while circumventing problems that plague today's education system. Opponents counter that homeschooled children miss out on the opportunity for social development that occurs in standard classroom environments and school settings. School choice advocates promote the idea that more choice allows parents and students a more effective educational experience that is right for them. They may choose a non-traditional school because it is more aligned with their philosophy, because they've been bullied or had other trouble in their neighborhood school, or because they want to prepare for a specific career, American Federation for Children 2017. School choice opponents may argue that while the alternative schools may be more effective for those students who need them and are fortunate enough to get in, the money would be better spent in general public schools. Remote and hybrid schooling. The COVID-19 pandemic was among the most disruptive events in American education. You likely have your own stories, successes, failures, and preferences based on your experiences as students, parents, and family members. Educators at every level went through stages of intense stress, lack of information, and difficult choices. In many cities and states, families, school districts, governments, and health departments found themselves on different sides of debates. Countless arguments raged over attendance, mental health, instructional quality, safety, testing, academic integrity, and the best ways to move forward as the situation began to improve. College students and their families went through similar disruptions and debates, compounded by the fact that many students felt that the high costs of particular colleges were not worth it. Overall, college enrollment dipped significantly during the pandemic. At the time of this writing, the sociological and educational impact of the pandemic is difficult to assess, though many are studying it. Overall, data indicates that most outcomes are negative. Students underperformed, stress and mental health problems increased, and overall plans and pathways were interrupted. Perhaps most damaging was that the pandemic amplified many of the other challenges in education, meaning that under-resourced districts and underserved students were impacted even more severely than others. On the other hand, once instructors and students adapted to the technological and social differences, many began to employ new techniques to ensure more caretaking, connection, differentiated instruction, and innovation. Most agree that education will be changed for years following the pandemic, but it might not all be for the worse. This has been Introduction to Sociology, third edition from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by the Los Angeles Harbor College Foundation. Los Angeles Harbor College is a public community college and your gateway to an affordable and outstanding college education. You can register for in-person and online courses today by visiting www 
lahc.edu. Whether you are just starting your college journey, nearing graduation, or planning to transfer to a university, LAHC can help you achieve your educational goals. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can also download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.